This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good evening to everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. David Cantor, and I'm the Director of the Refugee Law Initiative here at the University of London. If anybody's expecting to be in a seminar called Writing Slave Trade Abolition, or they prefer to be in that seminar, it's next door. Okay, apparently there's some confusion between the two seminars. Um, for those of you who were hoping for a seminar on refugee law, well done, you're in the right place. Uh, we're very, very pleased to continue our seminar series this evening on EU asylum law with a presentation by Dr. Brid Negroina, who's joining us from the University of Sheffield. And Brid's presentation is on the very topical issue of safety zones in countries of origin, a violation of international law, question mark. Now, this is part of the European Asylum Law Seminar Series, and it speaks to issues which are becoming more and more current in Europe every day. You'll have noticed, those of you who follow European Union Asylum Law, that over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a constant pushing back of borders from the EU right across to the external borders of the European Union itself, and trying to push borders back even to third countries and countries of origin. Safety zones are a little bit in the same category as things like safe third countries, except that the idea of safety zones, very briefly, is that a zone is established in a country of origin where people are safe, where people can go to be safe, safe from conflict usually, and therefore they shouldn't need asylum in other places like Europe. So the question that Brid's asking is a very important legal one. Are safety zones of these kinds permitted by international law? Brid, of course, comes to us with a great deal of expertise on all of these sorts of issues. She wrote her PhD on the law of uh, internally displaced persons, which is where a lot of these issues about safety zones play out. She's a refugee lawyer as well, and has written on all sorts of aspects of refugee law, particularly in relation to the internal flight system, which again comes into play here quite a lot. Prior to her academic career, she um, was a researcher at the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, and also worked briefly in the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia. So she brings a great deal of expertise here, and we're really, really pleased to welcome her. Over to you, Bruce. Um, thank you very much, David, and to the Refugee Law Initiative for inviting me here today um, to give, give a talk. Um, so this topic, um, as, as you'll probably guess from David's introduction, stems from my, my doctoral research, which looked at the relationship between protecting people who are displaced within countries of origin and international refugee law. Um, so just a, a few disclaimers at the beginning. Um, first of all, I have a cold, so I apologise if uh, my voice is not as good as it, well, less good than it normally is. Um, and secondly, um, even though I'll be talking about the, the political considerations involved in different case studies, for example, my area really is, is the international law surrounding it. Um, so just to, um, just to sort of set out what my, my expertise is in the, in the beginning. Um, so just to, to get started... Um, so, who is a refugee? I know some of you are, are not refugee lawyers, I know some of you are not lawyers in the first place, so for those of you who are experts in this area, please, please bear with me. A refugee is someone who has left their country of origin because they're being persecuted um, for specific reasons, and um, they, they can't go back, to put it quite, quite simply. Um, and to give a picture of, of what the refugee sort of problem is, is like today, there are currently 13 million refugees uh, of concern to the UN Refugee Agency worldwide as of mid-2014. They were the latest figures I could come across. Um, and basically, when someone leaves their country of origin, um, it represents the, the breaking of the bond between the refugee and their state. And that's when they can claim international protection. And a refugee is granted legal status and protection under the 1951 Refugee Convention. Um, contrary to what we hear in the news about this whole European crisis, most refugees go to states near, near their own country. So most refu Syrian refugees, for example, are in states surrounding Syria. Um, to give an idea of, of where they are, um, Turkey has by far the most, 2.2 million. Lebanon has 1.1 million. 
Jordan has 631,000, Iraq 245,000, and Egypt 128,000. Europe has only received about 10% of those who have fled. So all of the European countries have a very comparatively small proportion of those who have fled Syria. Um, about 534,000 have claimed asylum in Europe between April 2011 and September 2015. Um, so the point I'm really trying to make with this slide is first of all, when refugees flee, they usually stay near the country that they have fled from. And, and secondly, even though this is perceived to be a European crisis, it's nothing compared to what the states nearby um, have, to, have to deal with. And this is reinforced, as, as David mentioned previously, non-entering policies. So what states such as European states generally want, because refugees cost them a lot of money, is that they never come in the first place. So what we mean by non-entry policies are, for example, um, sanctions for airlines who allow refugees on, on board their flights, strict visa requirements, um, and some pushback at sea operations have been, were taking place um, in the Mediterranean, for example. Um, so just to, to move on um, to what, what I'm speaking about today is preventative protection which is, I would think, is a sort of non-entry policy as well. It's this idea of protecting people within their country of origin so they don't have to come here to claim asylum. And the U it's this idea of protecting people displaced within their countries of origin who are called IDPs. There are far more IDPs in the world than refugees. About 38 million, in fact, so they outnumber them by more than two to one. Um, 7.6 million IDPs in Syria alone. There are far more people displaced within their countries than are displaced outside of their countries. So the UNHCR has described this concept of preventative protection as the establishment or undertaking of specific activities inside the country of origin so that people no longer feel compelled to cross borders in search of protection and assistance. And the sort of, um, so protecting people internally so they don't have to cross the border and become refugees. Now they'll sell it as you know, humanitarian assistance or things like that, but often states are motivated by this desire to, to keep them there, will protect them there so they don't have to come here. And the different terms that they've used for this concept are safe zones, safe havens, um, buffer zones, the right to remain, um, etc. Um, and more recently, the um, French US and US governments have called and have said they've agreed on such a safe zone in Syria. So I'll be discussing that a, a little bit later. So the core questions I would like to look at is, first of all, is protection of persons within their country of origin an alternative for granting refugee status? Is this okay in refugee law to grant someone protection within their country of origin, or protection, so they don't have to claim refugee status. And secondly, and relatedly, they're not, the two are not distinct, um, do the establishment, or does the establishment of such safety zones breach any provision of international law? Is it, for example, a violation of the freedom of movement of those people? Is it against the prohibition of use of force in the UN Charter? Um, so that is, that is to come later. To give an outline of, of what I'll do today, I'll uh, go into a little bit more detail on what preventative protection is. I'll discuss some case studies. Um, depending on how much time I have, that will determine how many I go into. But I will certainly look at Iraq in the 1990s and Bosnia. Um, probably if I have time, look at Afghanistan in 2000. But we'll, I will also, of course, will touch upon this idea of having a safety zone in, in Syria more recently. Um, I'll do a quick evaluation on this, lessons learned, why have certain safety zones been more successful than others, um, what are the key criteria that determines the relative success, for lack of a better word, of, of a safety zone. I'll engage in a legal analysis then, looking at, I won't go into humanitarian law, but um, the prohibition of use of force in the UN Charter, human rights law, and uh, refugee law. And finally, I'll, I'll give some very brief conclusions. Um, this is a work in progress, so I would invite questions, but especially invite any sort of constructive ideas or comments that you might have at the end uh, would be very much welcome.
So just to give a brief outline of, of where this idea of protecting people internally instead of externally came from. It's a relatively new idea. The focus has traditionally been on protecting people who have been displaced externally. And the reason for that is, is twofold, really. Um, first of all, traditionally, someone, recognizing someone as a refugee ha was a strategically, um, politically beneficial. You are acknowledging the fact that their country of origin was not able to protect them. So you could do that for political reasons. And secondly, it is easier to give someone protection when they've left their country of origin because of sovereignty concerns. Um, protecting people within their country of origin raises quite a few issues under international law. In 1972, the Economic and Social Council of the UN requested the UN Refugee Agency to coordinate humanitarian assistance for persons displaced within the country. I should have put it up there, it's, it's uh, Sudan that they were referring to. So that was one of the first issues of internal protection to appear on the international agenda. And this was followed over a decade on by Thailand's proposal that a study be undertaken for the possible establishment of safety zones to assess, assist IDPs as a way of lessening the burden on the international community. However, in the post-Cold War era, as I mentioned earlier, the recognition of refugees was no longer seen as a strategic political act. And that's where we got this, these types of non-entry measures, as, as, as David mentioned previously. Ways to stop refugees coming to the, sh to, to the states um, so that they wouldn't be able to claim refugee status. So, as we mentioned earlier, carrier sanctions, strict visa controls, things like that. And also, a new um, vocabulary began to enter refugee discourse, comprising of terms like preventative protection, uh, right to remain, that was, that was one, a good one, uh, buffer zones, relief corridors, and safety zones. And parallel to all these developments was the development of legal protection for people displaced within their countries. Um, so for example, now we have the guiding principles on internal displacement, a soft law document, so it's not in itself legally binding, it guides states on how to deal with persons displaced within their countries of origin. And even though it's not binding, it's been very influential in developing um, domestic provisions, for example. And there's a, quite a few constitutional law cases in, in Colombia, for example, that see these um, principles as authoritative. There are also two treaties that in Africa that protect people displaced within their countries. And we have a special rapporteur, Professor Chiloka Bayani, on the rights of internally displaced persons. So basically, there's been a movement since the 1970s focusing on people who have been displaced within their country, um, as opposed to the traditional focus, which has been on people who have been um, displaced outside of their country. And this created a new dilemma for the UN Refugee Agency. So the UN Refugee Agency's primary mandate is exactly what it says in its title, to protect refugees. Um, but it also has a mandate to protect internally displaced persons. And the question before then, when this idea of safety zones was being, was being pushed, was should it resist this concept of preventative protection because of the potential conflict with the right to leave and seek asylum, which I will go into a bit later, or should it take a more practical approach, acknowledging the fact that states are going to close their borders to refugees, and states fund the UNHCR's activities, and therefore have significant influence over the type of activities it can carry out. So should it just take a practical approach and say, well, you know, states are going to do this anyway, we may as well assist people who are displaced within their borders. And ultimately they took the latter approach. So to give some examples of, of some safety zones um, and ones who, that are relatively successful and, and unsuccessful, uh, the first one is the Open Relief Centres in Sri Lanka in the 1990s. And this is an example of safe areas that operated relatively well. And so these were described as temporary places where displaced persons on the move can freely enter or leave and obtain essential relief in a relatively safe <coughs> environment. And the objectives of these um, open relief centres were fourfold. 
The first one was to maintain UNHCR's presence in the area um, so they could monitor, monitor developments regarding returnees, people who were refugees but who had come back to Sri Lanka. Secondly, to assist displaced persons. Third, and this is the important one, to reduce the pressures on people to leave. And finally, to promote conditions for voluntary repatriation, to encourage people who had fled to, to come back. And these open relief centres were ultimately seen as a test case to see to what extent the international community would be willing to accept the UNHCR undertaking activities within a country of origin. And in contrast to the examples that I will go through later, these were a relative success. Um, despite occasional evictions and security incidents, no one who is known to have sought sanctuary in the open relief centres are known to have died as a result of military action. And as you'll see later, that is not the case for many other such states as only. Um, and I would argue, and some other academics argue as well, that this is for, for two reasons, really. Um, well, actually one, really. Um, that they were negotiated on the ground and that there was consent um, for these open relief centres. So all parties were in favour of, of, of these open relief centres. Um, another example is Operation Provide Comfort <coughs> in Iraq in the, that should be the 1990s, well, the 1990s. Um, so in the, po in the aftermath of the Gulf War, um, following Saddam Hussein's persecution of the Kurds, that led to a mass flight um, from Iraq. So 1.8 million fled. And Turkey was afraid that of this mass influx into Turkey, that this would cause stability within Turkey. Um, so Turkey decided to close its borders. So you had a huge amount of displaced persons within Iraq and Turkey um, closing its borders. And at that time, there was more than 200,000 Kurdish refugees trapped in the mountains or living in the mountains between Iraq and Turkey. And the initial response of the UNHCR was to try and persuade Turkey to open the borders. But because of the strategic interests of the United Kingdom, United States, and France, they, were willing to, they weren't willing to condemn Turkey's actions. And instead, they negotiated to create a safe zone within Iraq. And that ultimately undermined what UNHCR was trying to do, which was to put pressure on Turkey to open its borders. So what the UK, US and France did was they gave a very broad interpretation of a Security Council resolution that referred to massive flows of refugees and they used that as a basis to set up a safety zone within Iraq. Even though the Security Council resolution referred to the, sovereign, uh, the territorial integrity of Iraq, so most people would disagree that this Security Council gave a basis for the establishment of, of a safe zone. Um, later on, there was a memorandum of understanding agreed between the UN and Iraq, um, but this referred to establishment of UN humanitarian centres within the country and not unilateral action by France, the UK and, and others. And just to give a brief evaluation of this, um, this was really the plan B, the, the, the Operation Provide Comfort. It only happened after Turkey closed its borders. Um, the illegality of this operation has been questioned, as I, as I just mentioned. Um, however, it operated relatively well. Um, the majority of the refugees who were in the mountains were able to leave and return to Iraq where it was easier to provide humanitarian relief. So even though the legality of the operation is questionable, um, the results were not, not the worst example of a safety zone that we could we can um, Bosnia in 1992 is probably the most famous example of, of a safe zone um, that was not at all successful. So during 1992, the Bosnian Serb army proceeded to ethnically cleanse large parts of Bosnia, uh, which drove 100,000 civilians into, into towns. And the EU closed its borders uh, to the Bosnians by imposing strict visa controls. And a large discussing ensued about, and this was what I thought was, oh, it was, it was terrible. By, by the European Union argued that by accepting Bosnian refugees, they would be assisting in ethnic cleansing, and that was the that was the argument they made against assisting Bosnian refugees. Um, and Sadako Okada, who was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, summed it up very well. I thought she said, 
If you take these people, you are an accomplice to ethnic cleansing. If you don't, you're an accomplice to murder. So Germany called for European states to take in more refugees. That wasn't met with much enthusiasm. Um, however, Slovenia suggested creating safe areas within the country of origin, and that was met with a lot of international support. Um, so the proposal said that it would, and I quote, avert new flows of refugees and displaced persons from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Safety zones should facil facilitate the provision of humanitarian assistance to the needy and would include inter alia, shelter, food aid, medical care, agricultural re rehabilitation, and other humanitarian and relief measures. Um, the United States was also in favor. Um, they said that they had, they were more explicit about it. it, it was contribute to the goal of preventing the next wave of refugees. And as I said, many states justified the creation of these zones because they said, otherwise we will be assisting in, in ethnic cleansing. States also relied on this, they, what they called the right to remain um, of those displaced by conflict, um, which I would argue was, was misused or, or, or abused um, in order to undermine the right to flee. So the Security Council passed a resolution uh, establishing safe areas within Bosnia. And even though um, UN Pro 4 or UN PRO FOR um, asked for 34,000 troops, they were only granted 7,600. They were not given any enforcement measures. Um, and furthermore, and the, the zones were not demilitarized. So the Bosnian army used them as a, as a training ground uh, for launching attacks. So the Serbs viewed it as, as a threat. Um, and although the safe havens did save lives in, in some respect, um, history has perceived them to be a failure. Uh, two of the safe havens fell to the Serbs, and as I'm sure you know, the Bosnian Serb forces entered Srebrenica in July 1995, following which more than 7,000 Muslim men and boys were, were killed. So I won't, I won't go into this example. Um, okay. uh, so Rwanda in 1994 is, I think my, an ultimate example. So in 1994, the Security Council authorized a French proposal for the deployment of a temporary multinational force in Rwanda, and this was called Operation Turquoise. And the mandate of this operation was to contribute to the security and protection of displaced persons, refugees, and civilians at risk, including through the establishment and maintenance of humanitarian areas. And it has been credited as stemming the flows of refugees to Zaire, and thus saving many lives. Uh, it protected some of the Tutsis remaining in the zone. It protected Hutu troops from revenge killings. Um, however, it's been criticized as ero eroding the Rwandan right to flee. Um, so there's been sort of a mixed, I would say, um, there's been mixed criticism of this, of this um, example of the Tutsi zone. And to, to move on to to Syria more recently. So Turkey over the last few years has been calling for a safe zone in, in Syria and it's not surprising. As you could see from the figures earlier, it has over two million refugees. And on the 27th of July this year, the United States confirmed that it has agreed to Turkish demands to set up a coalition protected safe zone inside northern Syria in return for, for Turkey permitting um, US aircraft to use their military bases to launch attacks on Islamic State. So the safety zone is here on, on this map. Um, it'll stretch supposedly for 68 miles along the border, about 40 miles deep. And France has also indicated its support for this safe zone. Um, there, however, there's very limited details available on what this, this safe zone would entail. Um, in the response to this safe zone has been, has been mixed. Uh, however, to quote Antonio Guterres, who is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, um, he stated that, in our opinion, it is always good that there are areas where there is no violence and in which people can be protected. That is positive. But safe areas should not undermine the right of people to seek and enjoy asylum. Safe areas could not be seen as a deposit for refugees. Experience shows these kind of situations are very risky, and we have the tragic event in Srebrenica. That was supposed to be a safe area. The complexity of our situation in Syria makes it very difficult to have an area that is absolutely safe for our purposes.
So I'd like to do a brief evaluation now on, on it's, well, it's difficult to do because obviously every situation is, is entirely different. Every safe zone or safe haven is completely different. But some basic principles that I've, I've come across about why safety zones have been have failed or, or not. Um, the first one is failure to demilitarize. So in Bosnia, for example, uh, the safe zones were used as training in military camps and were ultimately perceived as a threat, the same in, in Rwanda. We can contrast this to Iraq, for example, which were non-military in nature, and the operation was clearly identified as protecting Kurdish civilians. Secondly, lack of consent um, can, can be relevant. Um, the failure to gain consent of the parties, it was evident in, in Bosnia. We can contrast that to the open relief centres in Sri Lanka, which I mentioned earlier, where all parties were agreed in their establishments. And third, they've proven to be ineffective in well, some examples in situations of ethnic conflict. And logically, this is because in situations of ethnic conflict, the shared interest in protecting the civilians is just not there because the civilians are the target. However, we will acknowledge that of course there are benefits to this type of protection in, in safety zones. Um, First of all, it ameliorates the conditions that force people to flee their countries of origin in the first place. So it, it, that's particularly relevant for people who have no desire or who are unable to cross an international frontier. There's a lot of people who don't want to leave their countries, no matter how terrible the war or ethnic conflict gets. It's very difficult to leave where you've, you've come from. Um, so often we presume that everyone within this area wants to leave. No, of course they don't. Some people will stay. Um, and some people cannot leave. It costs quite a bit of money to, to leave. Um, and they're unable to cross an international frontier. This has been... States have interpreted this as the so-called right to remain. Um, this mechanism was developed by the UNHCR. Um, it was designed to, uh, to solve the problem of countries being increasingly reluctant to receive refugees on a large scale. Um, but has the right to remain undermined the right to leave? Um, it's, it's not quite clear. And it could be the only course of action where borders are being closed. As we're seeing, Europe is becoming, for example, in the Syrian context, more and more strict on, on who is going to, to um, allow to, to claim refugee status. Eventually, even the rare occasions where the states are generous, um, after a while they start to become less and less generous. So often it is the only course of action that can be taken um, where um, states are, are, are refusing refugee status. However, safety zones reflect states' interest in circumventing rather than openly challenging the effect of border closures on refugees' right to asylum and international protection. So, Rather, as we saw in the case of Iraq, than challenging Turkey's decision to close its borders, what happened to keep Turkey happy was that certain states were willing to support the creation of a safety zone rather than challenging what, what Turkey was, was doing. And eventually the UNHCR had to sort of see to that. Um, it reflects the desire to reduce refugee flow, flows. But this isn't necessarily a, a, a it's not all, all a, bad, a bad thing, um, but often it, it stems that often the reason for establishing these safety zones really comes from the perspective of, of states who are receiving refugees who don't want to receive as many anymore. It worsens the displacement situation within the state. Instead of having a huge amount of refugees outside of the country, what a safety zone will logically create is a huge amount or a bigger amount of internally displaced persons within the country. Um, which of course itself is a huge problem, but as the external states will say, well then it's, at least it's not in our territory. UNHCR's mandate can be compromised. Um, so the UNHCR is supposed to be a non-political actor, uh, however safe havens are based on entirely political criteria, so if the UNHCR is expected to get involved, that can compromise its mandate. Um, I would argue they're not sustainable, it's a short-term solution. How long can you expect someone to live in a safe zone? 
where they're living in sort of camps and may not have access to clean water, may not be very safe. How can you compare that to receiving refugee status, which is, it's not, it's not always great, but arguably it would be better. Um, and it could be a violation of, of various provisions of international law, which I'll, I'll talk about now. Um, the prohibition on the use of force, for example, human rights law and possibly refugee law. So yes, that's what I'll do now. Um, in terms of use of force, safe havens are legal where the state concerned has given consent. It's quite straightforward. Um, so that's the, so there was consent. It's not it's not clear if there was consent in Iraq, as I as I mentioned earlier. The um, the states that set up the safe haven said that they were interpreting Security Council Resolution six eight eight as allowing for the establishment of a safe haven. Um, even though, as I said, it, it made it quite clear that it reaffirmed the sovereignty and territorial integrity of, of Iraq. And it's what's interesting about that resolution is it referred to the massive flow of refugees towards and across international frontiers, rather than focusing on the humanitarian suffering within Iraq. So already you can see explicitly in the resolution what the concern was <coughs> about the refugees. Not so much, I mean, obviously they were concerned about people displaced within their country, but the focus really in the resolution was on refugees. So I would argue that in Iraq, the real purpose of setting up the safe, safe havens was to prevent refugees from entering Turkey, and therefore keep Turkey happy, strategically, and secondly, to destabilize the government of Iraq. Now we can contrast this again to the uh, open relief centers where consent was given. Where there's not consent, there is one clear exception. There's one clear, not exception, um, one clear example in international law where use of force is per per permitted, which is when the Security Council wants to um, So we have to look at the UN Charter. Article 51 says, there is a right of self-defense if an armed attack occurs. I would say that you cannot rely on this for the creation of the state zone. Um, because if your argument is that we are using force to create a safe zone to alleviate human suffering, um, then arguably you're not making an argument that an armed attack has occurred. Your argument is different. Right? So um, it requires something, it requires an armed attack to rely on, on Article 51. Um, what is more helpful is um, Article 39, which says the Security Council can take measures, this includes use of force or authorizing force, where there is a threat to the peace, a breach of the peace, or an act of aggression. And Security Council practice since the 1990s has showed us that they are willing to accept a mass displacement as a threat to the peace or a breach of the peace. So um, even, even where it's internal, so even when there's internal um, displacement, but more often where there's mass refugee flows, they're willing to accept that this could justify the use of force. But of course, that requires a Security Council resolution to be passed. Um, and there are five members of the Security Council who can veto that resolution. Um, so obviously for political reasons, often a uh, resolution would not be able to be passed for the creation of a, of a safety zone. But is there an exception? What if there is a state or two in the Security Council that is exercising its veto power and it is impossible to pass a resolution authorizing the creation of a safety zone? Some people argue that there is an exception for humanitarian intervention in international law, that this is an exception to the prohibition on the use of force. And this is unilateral intervention. Um, by unilateral, I mean not within the UN framework. So it could be more than one state, but um, they're not doing it in a, within a UN uh, authorized <coughs> framework. Um, some argue that this is a, an exception to the, to the use of force. Um, and for example, they relied on this when, or some states relied on this when it came to the bombing of, of Kosovo, when NATO bombed Kosovo in the 1990s. Um, so some general rules have, have, have arisen in international law. If this exception applies, when does it apply? Um, the first one is the existence of a humanitarian emergency or human rights, gross human rights violation. Secondly, is the inability or unwillingness of that state to address the 
situation. Third is the exhaustion of all possible peaceful remedies. And fourth is the acceptance of limitations on the use of force, that it is absolutely necessary, that it is the last resort, and that the use of force is proportionate to the aim pursued. So I would argue, and this is sort of an article that might come together sometime in, in the future with my colleague Russell Buchan at the University of Sheffield, who does the use of force thing, uh, use of force area. So I would argue that um, the creation of using force to create a safe zone is probably the sort of best argument you can make in favour of this exception. Because if we apply this criteria to the bombing of, of Kosovo in the 1990s by NATO, I mean, you could argue that you know, bombing an area is not very proportionate to the aims to be achieved. However, if you're creating some sort of safe zone where you're not using that same amount of force, arguably that passes this test a lot easier than the situation in, in the 1990s. That does say human rights law, um, extraterritorial application of treaties. So to, to explain this to um, anyone who's, who's not an international lawyer, um, the question that I'm trying to think about here is, if a safety zone is established, who has the obligation to protect human rights there, if any? Um, and do human rights protections exist in a safe zone? So basically I'm looking at all of the different legal considerations that comes with um, the establishment of safe zones, not whether or not they're legal or not, but all of the framework that's involved. <coughs> and a treaty can be applicable extraterritorially where a state exercises effective control outside of its boundaries. So if a state acts outside of its territory, if the United Kingdom establishes a safe zone somewhere else, for example, if they are in effective control of that area, they are bound by whatever human rights treaties or laws that the UK is bound by. So even though they're acting outside of the UK, somewhere else, somewhere foreign, they are still responsible under international law for any human rights violation they might um, commit. So some examples are if migrants are intercepted on the high seas, it's not a black hole of human rights law, um, human rights obligations still apply. Um, so a ship that intercepts them <coughs> will have um, that state the ship of that state will have obligations. Uh, where persons are detained in prisons abroad, uh, by, by, by um, for example, uh, UK prisons over, overseas, where, or the, where the UK has imprisoned people overseas, the UK still owes them human rights violations, even though it's outside UK territory. Um, so to apply this to safety zones, the first question would be, well, who's in effective control of the safety zone, and therefore has the obligation to protect human rights? This is all theoretical, where we're not talking about any specific safety zone. And more interestingly, I think, monitoring and enforcement of that right. So if we were to set up a safety zone in Syria, for, for example, um, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. There was a case before the European Court of Human Rights some years ago um, called Behrawi and Saramati. And in that case, um, some troops from Norway, Germany, and France were given to a UN mission in Kosovo. And it was alleged that those troops had committed human rights violations and the, the persons concerned took a case for the European Court of Human Rights. And the European Court of Human Rights said that they would attribute those actions to the UN, not to those individual states. And because the European Court of Human Rights doesn't have a mandate to interpret, secure, to interpret UN acts, that they weren't able to determine whether or not a violation had occurred. So if we were to set up a zone in Syria, for example, um, that same issue could occur if it was some sort of UN-led force, the Security Council Resolution, for example. However, if, for example, there was a, a unilateral action on behalf of France, then um, those actions could perhaps be attributed to France if there was some sort of violation. But this is, again, all quite theoretical. Right, right so human rights law, um, what, what substantive rights could be breached or could be applicable in a, in a safe zone. We have in international law um, the right of freedom to, of movement and the right to leave a state. <coughs> so this is set out originally in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 13 provides there's two prongs, two prongs to it, freedom of movement within a state and the right to leave a state. And this 
this right can be seen in many other bindings. So the Universal Declaration is not in itself binding, but there are plenty of treaties that have this, this, this provision in it. And they're essentially written in similar language. The first part of it is freedom of movement within the state, and the second part is external um, right, right to leave. However, um, there's, these rights can be limited. So the right of freedom of movement can be limited um, in certain circumstances. Um, and the, the, the treaties involved usually set out what these circumstances, or what these, um, how they can be limited. So it must be in accordance with law, it must be to protect essential interests of the state, and almost every limitation clause in these different treaties requires a proportionality that it does not impair the essence of the right. And the right of freedom of movement can also be derogated from in a time of emergency. Um, so that, that right can be temporarily suspended, but there are conditions that go with that. For example, um, the emergency involved must be life-threatening to the nation. There's a duty to inform the international community about the derogation imposed, and the derogation has to be non-discriminatory um, and must, be, must not go any further than what is absolutely necessary. So essentially, we have a right of freedom of movement and a right to leave the country. However, those rights can be derogated from in certain situations. Um, so depending on the type of safety zone or what the conditions are, I mean, an argument could be made that the freedom of movement wouldn't necessarily be breached if one of those um, limitations were to apply. A question that comes up a lot when we speak about safety zones is the right to seek asylum. So does it prevent people from leaving their country of origin to claim asylum elsewhere? Is there a right to seek asylum in international law? So Article 14, Paragraph 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says there is. Everyone has the right to seek and enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. However, the Universal Declaration is non-binding, and this right has been gradually watered down by states since 1948. So it's clear that there's a right to leave your country. We looked at that previously. However, there is no general right of asylum that's opposable to another state. So scholars agree that this provision affords the individual a right to seek asylum without spe specifying who has the duty to give effect to that right. And actually, when this, when this resolution, the Universal Declaration, was being drafted, it was suggested to include a right to seek and be granted asylum, but that was ultimately rejected. And the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, one of the major human rights treaties, doesn't include a right to asylum. The 1951 Refugee Convention also doesn't include a right to be granted asylum. And the most recent declaration of the international community on this issue, the Vienna Declaration, um, reiterate Article 14, Paragraph 1 of the Universal Declaration without going any further. So basically, there isn't really a right to be, there is no right to be granted asylum in, in international law. So to move on to, to more provisions of refugee law, the prohibition of Ufumo. This states that no contracting state to the Refugee Convention can send someone back to a place where their lives or freedoms are endangered. So it's difficult to say whether or not this would apply in safety zones. States would try and argue, refugee receiving states, that this only applies when they have crossed a border. So that this would only apply if, if someone arrived in the United Kingdom, for example, not if the United Kingdom set up a safety zone elsewhere. And we can apply this by analogy to a case that arose um, in the Czech, the Czech Republic, whereby U there was a UK immigration prevented Roma from boarding planes to the United Kingdom because they knew they would try and claim a refugee status there. And it went to the, the House of Lords, and the House of Lords said that Refuma was not engaged, they hadn't breached the Refugee Convention because the Roma had not made it to the territory of the United Kingdom. And when the guiding principles on internal displacement were being drafted in 1998, they thought, well, is there any sort of right of internal refoulement? Is there a prohibition of within a country sending someone to a place where their lives and freedoms are in danger? And they, they accepted that there wasn't. 
However, perhaps we can argue constructive reformal. So even though it isn't a breach of the word of the text, right? if, we, if we take a very textual approach, it probably isn't. But we look at the object and purpose of the convention as a whole. And it's this whole idea of sending someone back to a danger zone that it tries to prohibit. And also there is jurisprudence that provides that, first of all, the refugee convention applies at the border, that reform applies at the border. You don't have to cross a border for it to apply. And we can also make an analogy to those cases that say that pushback operations at sea, operating outside of a state's um, territorial jurisdiction, are a breach of the refugee convention. So we could use those sort of, um, sort of more evolutionary interpretation of, of this provision to argue that returning someone to a safe zone, which is not safe, right? If it's safe, then you probably can't argue it. But if you send it to a place which is like, for example, in um, Srebrenica or somewhere in Bosnia, then you could argue that it's possibly uh, Ufuma. Moving on, and nearly, nearly done, um, to the internal flight alternative. So what this presupposes is that a refugee receiving state, such as the United Kingdom, could and probably would make an argument that a person is not a refugee because they can go back to the state they came from and relocate to the safe, so-called safe zone. And that is known in refugee law as the internal flight alternative or the internal protection alternative. So the question is, if there is a safe place within their country that they can relocate, they are not a refugee. This idea that if there's anywhere, you should first try and find protection within your country, even if you have to move before coming to uh, another state to receive protection. And at this stage, there is no point, I think, in saying this is an incorrect interpretation of the Refugee Convention. It started in the 1980s in German jurisprudence, and now most states use it when they're uh, determining um, asylum um, claims. So not just obviously in the concept of, of safe areas or safe zones, but in all sorts of different types of, you know, you could relocate to the capital city and you'd be fine there, you'd be anonymous, no one would be able to find you, that sort of idea. Um, and now it forms part of refugee status determination in most states. And it's actually been incorporated into Article 8 of the RECAS EC Qualification Directive. So this, this um, binds uh, nearly all um, European, European states. Um, so it's, it's explicitly what it says is that when a European state is determining whether someone is a refugee, they are allowed to take into account any sort of protection measures, including protection by international organizations, which would of course refer to the UN or something like that, in the country of origin. So it's giving explicit permission to consider um, those sort of internal um, flight alternatives. And a big question is, could a safety zone be interpreted as an internal flight alternative? Well, yes, of course it could. And that's precisely the point why states want there to be safety zones in countries of origin. Um, because first of all, it means that less people will flee. And second of all, it could create an argument whereby you can refuse refugee status on the basis that they can go back. And it's happened in the past. So in Iraq in the 1990s, third states rejected asylum claims because people could go back to their safe havens. And in Bosnia in the 1990s, the European states denied asylum to Bosnian refugees because of the safe havens. And this is despite the fact, for example, one commentator said that safe areas in Bosnia were the most dangerous places in Bosnia. There are some legal considerations to bear in mind when we're talking about the internal flight alternative. Um, so relocation must be reasonable and it must not be unduly harsh. That's the sort of test that has come out in different domestic jurisdictions on whether or not you can send someone back and expect them to relocate. Um, and thankfully, there are other human rights law provisions applicable. So even if we read the refugee, or we, we, even if a state thinks someone can go back and relocate, that is not the end of the story. There's also human rights considerations at play. So for example, um, the European Court of Human Rights has found that return to Somalia where persons would have to live in a refugee camp, they found those conditions were, they called them dire, 
and therefore <coughs> removal to that to Somalia was prohibited under the under the European Convention of Human Rights. So even if it's found that there's an internal fight alternative, there are still certain human rights that we need to bear in mind about whether or not we could send someone back. And that's where I think that would help people who come from states where there are safe areas. That perhaps you know an internal fight alternative will be found, but then they can argue, well, actually there's European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence that tells us that where the conditions are dire, where I have to live in squalor as an internally displaced person, um, you cannot send me back. Okay. And the final provision of, of refugee I, I want to look at is cessation of refugee status. Could a state argue that because there is a safety zone in the country of origin, you are no longer a refugee? So if, if someone has, has left their country of origin, has been granted refugee status, and then following that, a safety zone is set up. Can they say, you're no longer a refugee now. We recognized you last week, but now there's a safe area. Now you can go back. Um, I would argue that no, they can't. Um, even though the Refugee Convention says that people are no longer refugees if the circumstances in connection with which he has been recognized as a refugee has ceased to exist. And they, oh, sorry, I didn't phrase that. Basically. A person is no longer a refugee if the reasons why they left are no longer applicable. So if you've left because of persecution and there's no longer persecution, then it's argued that you can go back and you're no longer a refugee. However, um, this is not a test that's easily satisfied. So the UNHCR has given us some criteria that should be applied. And bearing in mind that if, if someone is recognized as a refugee, they've already shown us that they're being persecuted. The, the threshold is really high to say that no longer exists. It's a very, I mean, it's a life or death situation. Um, so the, the threshold is very high. And UNHCR tells us that the change must be of a fundamental character. Um, so for example, that means that the, the changes which have taken place must address the causes of displacement that led to the recognition of refugee status. This can be the ending of hostilities, a complete political change, return to, um, situation of peace and stability. Um, and in the Abdullah case before the ECJ and held that this would be evidenced, for example, by the establishment of a court system that can protect, um, and, pr pr protect and prevent from persecution. The UNHCR also tells us this needs to be of an enduring nature. Um, I said earlier, safe zones are temporary, right? How can that be an enduring change? Um, they also should be given time to consolidate. Any change needs to be, it's not, a, you can't send someone back immediately. And also there must be a restoration of protection in the country of origin. Uh, it must be available, it must be effective, and it requires more than physical safety and security. There has to be a functioning government and basic administrative structures. Um, they also talk about human rights in this UNHCR um, report. They say that human rights don't have to be exemplary, but there are certain human rights that need to be protected, like the right to life and liberty, prohibition of torture, and a marked progress in establishing an independent judiciary. The UNHCR also says that even if there's a change in part of the country, so let's say a safe area, um, there, that, that's not sufficient. There needs to be, this country as a whole needs to be safe before someone goes back. However, the ECJ and the Abdullah case um, have implied that this is not necessarily the case, that if there's a part of the country that's safe, then they could go back. Um, but I would argue because this threshold, the standard is so high that even the most ruthless states would not be able to seize refugee status on the basis of a safe area, but more likely that they would be able to reject it in the first place um, instead. So to conclude, um, so the key factors in whether or not a safety zone is, and of course this is very general and, and cannot be applied in every situation, um, first, there should be consent, ideally, um, between the parties on the ground. The zone should not should be demilitarized, and it depends on what the type of conflict is. Every situation is different. It's impossible almost to give any sort of general principles. Um, a, a, secure, uh, a safety zone established without consent of the state of a, or a security council resolution is, is unclear as to its legality. So there should be, ideally, there should be consent. In the second place, there should be a Security Council resolution. If there's not a Security Council resolution, we're prodding on some dangerous legal, legal ground. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if there is, if this is permissible in international law, it's not clearly established yet. But if it is, there are some conditions like there has to be an emergency, humanitarian emergency, inability or unwillingness of the state to address the situation, exhaustion of all possible bill, um, remedies, and the acceptance of limitations on the use of force, such as, for example, if it's necessary, it's proportionate, um, etc. Actors of protection will be responsible under human rights law. So if a safety zone is set up, I would argue that if the, the states setting up the safety zone are in effect of control, they are bound by human rights law. Um, so it will not be some sort of legal black hole where there are no protections available. But as to the monitoring and enforcement of those human rights, that's where we run into some difficulties. Freedom of movement and the right to leave could be violated in the establishment of safety zones, but as I said out earlier, those freedoms in certain circumstances can be restricted and can be derogated from. So every, so every situation would have to be examined on its merits. There's no general right of asylum vis-a-vis -vis states. Um, however, safety zones may be misinterpreted as an internal protection alternative. But thankfully, there are some human rights provisions um, that would prevent removal. But I should emphasize, that's only in extreme cases. So in the, some, the case involving Somalia, that's only because the European Court of Human Rights said the situations there are dire. And they went through various NGO and UNHCR reports that talked of absolutely horrific conditions, like really like squalor, terrible conditions. Um, so um, the threshold is, ex is extremely, um, it needs to be really, really terrible for someone to be prevented, to be sent back. Um, so if it, it is at all livable, even if it's quite bad, uh, I would imagine that the human rights obligations might not be engaged. Um, safety zones cannot be a basis for cessation of refugee status. This is because cessation of refugee status only should only happen where the change has been fundamental and uh, the creation of a safety zone is, is temporary, not fundamental, um, and arguably does not reach this, this threshold. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions or comments, I'd very much appreciate them. Thank you. Thanks.